In this video, we're going to be learning how to size the branch circuits, thermal overloads, and overcurrent protective devices for three-phase motors, as well as the main feeder supplying those several motors and the overcurrent protective device protecting that feeder. So in the qu question we have in front of us, we have a feeder supplies four three-phase motors as follows. One 150 horsepower squirrel cage induction motor, one 30 horsepower wound rotor induction motor, and two 10 horsepower squirrel cage induction motors. The feeder is three phase, 460 volts. None of the motors have a code letter, and the motors have a 40 degree temperature rise and a 1.15 service factor. You have to very closely pay attention to the information that they give you because all of it is relevant to the outcome of the final question as you will see. So pay very close attention to what service factors are, temperature rises are, whether or not there's a code letter, and the actual type of motors that they're giving you. So the first thing that we need to do is go over to table 430.250. This is the full load current for three phase alternating current motors. And we'll go down and we'll see that our 150 horsepower is gonna have an FLC of 180 amps. Our 30 horsepower is gonna have 40 amps and our two 10 horsepowers are gonna be 14 amps. Very close, to, very necessary to pay attention to how many motors there are because sometimes when they give you the two, it's very easy to forget that there's two and just write down one. That's why I recommend diagrams to kind of give you that information a little more clearly. It will help you along the way. So we'll go and we'll lay these out, uh, our full low current ratings, because that allows us to continue with the equation and do the math in order to get the other answers that we need. So the first thing that we're gonna do is our thermal overloads. And we're gonna need to go to 430.32 in order to find out how to do that. Now this tells us that a separate overload device that is responsive to motor current, this device shall be selected to trip or shall be rated at no more than the following percent of the motor nameplate full load current rating. So it tells us that motors with a marked service factor of 1.15 or greater is 125%. Our motors are all rated at 1.15, so we qualify for this here. Then it goes on to tell us that motors with a marked temperature rise of 40 degrees Celsius or less. Our motors are 40 degrees Celsius, so we qualify on the second round. So we can use the 125% rating. So we'll do 180 amps times 1.25 or 125% and we will get a thermal overload of 225 amps for our 150 horsepower squirrel cage motor. We'll do 40 times 1.25 for 50 amps for the 30 horsepower wound rotor motor and we will do 14 times 1.25 to give us 17.5 amps for our 10 horsepower squirrel cage motors, our two 10 horsepower squirrel cage motors. So the next step in this process of determining all of this is to get our branch circuit sizes for the circuit supplying each individual motor. Now in order to figure out what we need to do for that, we need to go to 430.22. This is sizing conductors for a single motor, and it tells us that conductors that supply a single motor used in a continuous duty application shall have an opacity of not less than 125% of the motor full load current rating. Now, on your master's test or journeyman's test, it's a 99.9% .9 chance that any motor calculation that you get is going to be continuous duty. Any commercial, or, or should I say, Almost every single commercial motor is considered continuous duty. The only real world example that you're gonna come across that doesn't qualify as continuous duty is like a residential garbage disposal that is not a continuous duty. But if you're doing a motor that is not continuous duty, they will specifically tell you that it's not. And then of course you would do 100%. But since this is a continuous duty, it's a single motor, we're gonna use 125% to size our branch circuits. And to get that, we will come up with the same thing that we came up with the thermal overloads, right? We used 125%, so we don't need to redo the math in this specific question. So some questions, your thermal overloads may be the all other motors with 1.15, whereas you'll have to do the math with 125%. But since it's the same, we can use those exact same numbers to size our wire. And we'll go over to do that to 310.15B16, formerly 310.16. And we will see that for the 230 amps for the larger motor, the 150 horsepower, we will need number four aught. For the 30 horsepower, we will need number eight. Now, when we get to our 10 horsepower squirrel cages, you will see that in the 75 degree column, 
uh, you actually potentially could use number 14, right? However, those two asterisks that you see next to 18 through 10, if you look at the bottom of 310.15b16, they will reference you to 240.4d. Now, 240.4d says, unless specifically permitted in 240.4e or g, the overcurrent protection shall not exceed that required by d1 through d7. And if we look down at uh, uh, 240.4d3, we see that 14 gauge copper is only good for 15 amps. You can use that larger 75 degree or 90 degree rating in order to do ambient temperature and the number of conductors and the correction factors and so forth. However, when it comes to actually sizing branch circuits and such, you have to use the 60 degree for smaller conductors, which are 18 through 10. So we would actually have to use 12 wire on these 10 horsepower squirrel cage motors. And we come up with that. And the next step is to go to size the individual overcurrent protection for each motor. And in this example, we are going to use inverse time delay breakers. So to find out what we need to do to size those inverse time delay breakers, we're going to need to go over to table 430.52, which is the maximum rating or setting of motor branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective devices. And this will specifically lay out the specific types of motors that we're going to be using. So for our 150 horsepower, 150 horsepower squirrel cage motor, we will see in the chart that squirrel cage motors using inverse time delay breakers have a 250 percent rating so we'll take our 180 full load current full load amps and we'll multiply that by 2.5 or 250 percent and come up with 450 amps now that is a standard size we'll go ahead and use the 450 amps as our breaker size for the 30 horsepower wound rotor we'll go back to the chart and we will see that the inverse time delay breaker inverse time breaker will be a 150% multiplier that we're going to use. So we'll take that 40 amps times 1.5 and come up with 60 amps, which is again another standard size. We can go ahead and use a 60 amp breaker there. For the 10 horsepower squirrel cage motors that came out uh, to using number 12 wire, <clears throat> we will look at those squirrel cages and find out that they use 250% as well and we'll take 14 times 2.5 and get 35 amps, which is a more or less standard size uh, breaker and fuse as well. Now, if you see in this example, these are always even numbers. And you'll, you'll notice a trend on journeyman and master's exams. They tend to give you even numbers that you work with. They don't make it overly complicated on the math. And that's you know kind of appreciated in a way. It kind of saves you a little bit of time from chasing down the standard sizes and, and trying to move upwards with those. So now that we've acquired the size of the thermal overloads, the size of the branch circuits, and the size of the individual overcurrent protective devices, the next phase to do is to move on to the size of the feeder. And how we do this is a little different than how you would size a individual branch circuit. And it's detailed out to you in 430.24. This is titled several motors or a motor and other loads. It says conductors supplying several motors or a motor and other loads shall have an ampacity not less than the sum of each of the following. 125% of the full load current rating of the highest rated motor as determined by 430.6a. So we're going to take the full load current rating of the highest motor at 125%. Number two is the sum of the full load current ratings of all other motors in the group. So we will add that 125% of the full load current will then add on the full load current of the, the remaining motors. Now, if you're doing a large distribution panel, you could go to three and four where you would add 100% of the non-continuous non-motor load. This would be like receptacles and things like that. And then 125% of the continuous non-motor load. So this would be sign lighting. This would be the lights within a commercial building, so on and so forth. It's not very relevant to this equation. So how to do this math? We'll take the 180 times 1.25 plus 40 plus 14 plus 14. These are the other motors. And we'll come up with a final number of 293. Now, if we go to 310.15B16, we'll see that the wire size we need is number 350s. 
Now on to sizing the main overcurrent protection device. So for this example, this could be coming from a main distribution switch gear that is then feeding a motor distribution panel. So that is considered your main feeder supplying multiple uh, motors. And we would need to treat this differently than we would size a general feeder as well. And that is laid out to us in 430.62 rating or setting of a motor load. And it tells you that a feeder supplying a specific fixed motor loads and consisting of conductor sizes based on 430.24 shall be provided with a protective device having a rating or setting not greater, remember that, not greater than the largest rating or setting of the branch circuit, short circuit, and ground pot protective device for any motor supplied by the feeder based on the maximum blah 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 for hermetic refrigerant blah 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 where the rating or the setting of the branch circuit uh branch short circuit or ground fault protect devices used on two or more of the branch circuits supplied by the feeder one of the protective devices shall be considered the largest for above calculation so if you had 250 horsepower motors you would use one and you would do the math according to that <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and we're going to take the 450 and we're going to add that because that's our largest breaker size. And we're going to add the full load current of all the remaining motors. So it's similar to doing the feeder, except instead of doing the size of the quote on wire, the 125% times the full load current, and then adding the other full load currents, you're going to take the largest breaker and we're going to add the remaining full load current. So we would have 450 largest breaker plus 40 plus 14 plus 14 for 518 amps. Now here's where that not greater than comes into play because unlike a overcurrent protective device for a branch circuit where you could then go above right you could go up to the next standard size when you're sizing a motor multiple motors uh, overcurrent protective device for a multiple motor feeder you actually have to go down so we would take from the 518 and go down to 500 we would not go up and you would ultimately end up with a 500 amp inverse time delay breaker now you may be asking why we didn't do anything for that inverse time delay breaker. That's because we're not sizing the overcurrent protecting device for a motor. We're sizing it for the feeder supplying multiple motors. This is some things they will do within these exams to trip you up because they had you do those 250% and 175% and such for the inverse time delay breakers on the branch circuit overcurrent protective device. So then they will tell you that the main feeder is an inverse time delay, the main overcurrent protective device, to try to get you to take that 518 and multiply it by 250% or whatever to try to kind of screw you up a little bit. So you've got to know what you need to use when and where. So in this example, when you're doing the main overcurrent, you don't do anything. You come up with the 518, you cannot go greater than the, the largest. So you go back down to the 500, you don't exceed. And that is how you come up ultimately with the main overcurrent protective device. If you guys enjoyed the video, please click like, please leave a comment, and please consider subscribing to the channel for more content that will help you to pass and prepare for a master or journeyman electrician's exam.